as, as I said, we don't need a big uh, parties in London clubs to uh, launch a new startup. We can we can uh, get very far in terms of marketing with a relatively little expense. And to me, that is also a good way of assessing how flexible the founder is and how well they understand the value of the money that I am trusting them. Hello, I have Alex Hirsch here. He is the founder of ProServo Limited, an investment and advisory firm specialized on startups and SMEs. Alex has been an investor in small companies for most of his career. Starting as an activist investor in European small caps, he became increasingly fascinated by the investment potential of unlisted SMEs and advanced startups. His career background in financial services led Alex to focus primarily on fintech, although he has invested in other sectors. Alex sees his mission as an Asian investor to helping to increase the role of female founders and investors in the venture space. He serves on the board of Scale XP, one of his portfolio companies, as a non-executive director. He's also a visiting lecturer of strategies for the digital economy at the University of Law in London. So welcome, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Good to be here. Thank you for coming on board. So um, as you might know, this this podcast is is for founders that are looking to raise. And and one of the most important things I find when um, talking to founders is that they they don't really see it from the investor's point of view. So I wanted to have a number of guest investors on board just to see it from their side and just to give a little bit of insight and maybe allude to some secrets or some good techniques that, you, that you've heard. So I want to go through the whole spectrum from initial approach to talking to talking about the pitch decks and, and what you need to see in the due diligence process and, and all that sort of stuff. So what I want to first focus on with you is is looking at that initial first approach. I'm sure that you have many, many companies, many, many founders talking to you, trying to get in touch. What's What have you found to be a good first impression or a good first message or a good platform? Or what, what do you see as like the first interaction? What What, what impresses you about that? Yeah, uh, thank you for setting up this series of interviews. I think that's really valuable for the entire ecosystem. But um, I get a lot of approaches through LinkedIn. And just uh, on the basis that I have the words angel investor in my in my profile. So more often than not, I get uh, pitch decks saying, uh, here's my company, I need money, can you help? And uh, that is not immediately what I'm looking for. I'm The decks that are most interesting for me is where a founder can make the immediate link between my bio or my investment experience uh, and uh, the immediate track record and what his company or her company is trying to achieve in this case. So uh, someone that actually has taken the time to understand what my focus is, uh, what we're good at and what we can bring to the business. That's definitely a strong point. I mentioned LinkedIn, ideally, uh, the in the first contact would be in person so by introduction or through one of the pitch events but since not everybody has access to these events linkedin is a good place to start okay that's interesting you say in person so what sort of events do you attend that you see people at then so where are you based first of all let's let's just establish that quickly i'm based in southeast london so mm -hmm. i spend a lot of time just going into town, meeting people, meeting other investors, meeting uh, serial and first time investors, just uh, hearing what's going on, what they've come across, going to industry events and also to the alumni uh, events of various universities slash business schools. And um, this is when, when names come up, where uh, pitches come up, but also over time, we uh, obviously build a network with other uh, investor groups 
And whenever they see something that they think is relevant or that matches our profile or ap our appetite, that is when uh, the pitch finds its way to us. But um, as, as I said, this is for for a founder who's currently more worried about uh, getting the MVP uh, working. Finding all those uh, in-person events is probably uh, not uh, efficient. Therefore, if you, if uh, that person uses a scalable tool like LinkedIn, it's it's always important to make sure that uh, the approach stays relevant. It's interesting that you're talking about that, just the, the in-person thing, but the fact that other investors would send you things. I, I think that a lot of a lot of founders don't realize that that how connected investors are. Uh, do you find that some of the best ones have come through other investors having met them, or maybe they've had the cold approach and they've sent it on to you? Does that happen a lot? Yeah, Dave, I understand that um, that feeling that we are in competition or something with mm. each other. I come from the institutional fund management side where we're fighting for 10 basis points of outperformance, obviously having the slightest edge is an advantage. But um, my experience has been that we're helping each other because most of the time, especially in the pre-series space, uh, skills and capital are often at a premium. So we cooperate we share knowledge we do the due diligence together uh, for example the investor network uh, that i'm uh, associated with angel academy is uh, screening together they're building the syndicates together and then share the due diligence and if ever uh, we as a network are being approached by investors for whom we think it, this could be a re relevant investment idea. We're very happy to provide the introduction and share the due diligence that we've done until that point. So there is uh, there's no, not a feeling of competitiveness or of uh, this being a zero sum game. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's very very good point. Um, just just staying on that initial approach. So say it was a cold outreach or another investor telling you something about about the the thing that they that they found or the company that they found what is it in that initial sentence which is going to prick your ears up and make you think oh okay i definitely want to uh, talk to them or read their pitch deck yeah anything that links it to me to my track record to my interest to anything uh that the person has come across in my my experience so uh, very you said it in the in the opening bio i've spent uh, my career in financial services uh, therefore my network is there i've seen how banks hedge funds insurances how they work and as such if someone can then tell me look i'm trying to uh, accelerate and improve the kyc process the know your customer process which is very t uh, very tedious laborious time consuming and not a very fun process for the people involved uh, and if that person then says look i can see that you've worked in that space for for two decades uh, and i would really love to get your thoughts i would will be very happy to to jump on a call with that person that person just sends me an email and who knows what they're doing, restaurant reservations, and then says, um, yes, I can see you're an angel investor. Do you want to send me a check? That is definitely not going to work. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure you get you get plenty of those, right? Uh, far too many. Yeah. <laughs> too many. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's interesting, you said, you, again, you said about um, that you would you'd hear about the, the the approach and then you'd possibly get on the call. What what what, what role does the pitch deck come in, into that? Do, do you do you want them to send you the pitch deck document first or do you want to actually speak to them first? The pitch deck should come first mm -hmm. um, and the pitch deck should be um, more comprehensive than just a two page teaser. So it should give me the feeling about a what the idea is what the actual product or solution is that the founder is bringing to the market uh well it should give me a feeling for what 
uh, traction uh, has been achieved so far, who the team is, uh, and uh, what uh, the expectations for this investment round are. So I, I'm very keen to get a sense of the valuation and what the money is being spent on. So I understand that a lot of that is not clear, especially for a very early and first time founder, but I'm, I'm very happy to discuss that and to, to learn about the thinking. And uh, I, I'd, I'd argue that uh, most angel investors understand that it's not all carved in stone. So those are the aspects to, for, for me to see, but also to get a sense of uh, whether the founder is clear in his or her thinking, whether uh, there is a level of professionalism involved and also how serious they are about the, the fundraising. Um, it's, it's very important uh, that uh, there are no sloppy mistakes in the deck so that uh, the numbers are consistent, that there are no typos, the usual things that you would do when you're applying for anything really. So it's, it's the business card, but uh, afterwards, the talking to the founder is a very important step because we feel we can um, help a founder that is open to it, uh, make up for weaknesses in the team, but uh, a wonderful pitch deck cannot cover a, a weak founder. And, and And what information would you specifically need to see in the founder? Because I've... I've seen many pitch decks as you have, and a lot of the time you'll see a founder and a, a sort of a name and a title, and that's it. And I'm saying <laughs> you've got to put more information than that, right? Yeah, yeah, um, th that is that is very true. It's um, it's the modern approach, almost uh, the difference between the traditional CVs that you would send for applying for jobs and the modern ones. So, talk about relevant achievements. Uh, whether someone has worked for a well-known company or not, that doesn't doesn't tell me anything. So I want to get a sense of why this person thinks that he or she is the the right person to make this idea happen. So it's um, it's because they they had a trigger that caused them to start this company. They had. Um, they've done a project in their existing business or their previous career and realized, hey, I can do that for myself. And or uh, I was part of a big, slow company. And I, I can see that as an individual, as an entrepreneur, I can turn this into a unicorn idea. So that's the link that I want to see in their bio much less so whether they were working for a famous company or not. That is it's good to know uh, that they've gone through the formal process of a of a big company, but it's it's not particularly relevant for the investment decision. Yeah, so so you want to see achievements, you want to get a sense of their character, and and you want to understand why they're doing it. Is that is that, is that those are the main points that you were making there? Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, there is um, as an aside, there is an element of when people become too emotionally involved. So I'm yeah. looking for, on the other end of the spectrum, I'm looking for people to keep the economic focus, the business focus, because essentially as much as, as we're here to help uh, founders we become successful, we're, we're, we're not a charity, we're doing that uh, to, to make money at the end of the day. So. I, I find it particularly difficult when I come across businesses that were founded from the personal experience, from very painful experiences of some founders who are trying to, to change the world on, on that level. And um, in my experience, that is an important initiative that but it tends to make for relatively poor investments. So... On that basis, I'm happy to support uh, these founders, but it's a different process. It's a different due diligence than when I'm 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 looking to support a startup that hopefully makes it to the unicorn. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the main things that sort of nullify your interest straight away, just from reading the pitch deck? 
Yes, um, I was I was thinking of that going into um, this call, and definitely uh, a big big turnoff is uh, uh, I call it the pseudo customization. So they they use terms in the first approach that are that are meant to sound as if they uh, have looked at my profile, but really haven't. You know, I'm an angel investor, yes, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not particularly active in the costume, uh, consumer discretionary space. So uh, trying to uh, push this on the basis that I have done other investments is not particularly relevant, but uh, also trying to um, uh, drive this feeling of scarcity or we're three times oversubscribed and only one more week is left to commit your funds that that for me makes it irrelevant because i'm uh, one of those angel investors and um, i'm operating in the in the network of angel investors who want to get involved uh, we're here uh, to help the companies that we're getting involved with um, we're probably around when there is a follow-on round we want to provide our expertise and also probably introductions. So anyone who just treats me as a money source, as someone who probably just has had a bonus that he or she needs to park is immediately, is immediately ignored or even blocked to that point. Are there any resources available <clears throat> uh, within sort of, network uh, information or networks that you might be on where founders can look at your history look at your background see what you've invested in and get that you know sort of perfect investor profile that matches you i'm talking about things like maybe like signal pitch book uh angel list um crunch base stuff like that are, are you on those are you on those platforms yeah um crunch base uh definitely definitely and um it's uh, i'm now mainly talking for uh uk investors or uh, pre-series a so that that means probably still loss making that that kind of thing so mm. they are unlikely to have the immediate let's say uh power pitch so they still need support they still have gaps in the skill base and on that basis i would recommend searching uh for angel networks and there are plenty uh, in the in the uk most of them are very friendly very supportive and uh i mentioned my network angel academy but uh there there are plenty uh, just around london i can think of 10 to 15 in the in the university towns there are yet another good number of of companies uh, universities themselves tend to have angel networks and those are very uh, good places to start then there is the um, uk baa the UK Business Angel Association that uh, obviously is also uh, very helpful in uh, with uh, for for founders to help them find investors, help them find the skill base, and then uh, obviously accelerator programs and um, uh, all of these things uh, can just be put into Google, and then um, a founder can find a helping hand, most often free of charge and with a bit of luck even as a future investor mm. uh, yeah and just off the top of your head are, are there any networks that you apart from angel academy that you mentioned uh, that that, that invest that uh, founders should have a look at yes it, it really depends on on the kind of uh business that you're that you're targeting and um, so uh i'm working uh quite frequently with uh the uh, uh Cambridge-based uh, angel network, well, Cambridge Angels, mm -hmm. the name is well, what, what they do, uh, very, very professional, very uh, active uh, network, and uh, they're obviously more on the, they're, they're very also scientifically focused, so they've got 
the, the expertise to dive deeper into the deep tech items. Then there's the Alma, which is also a uh, female based in, in, in London. But um, there, there's a there's a large there's a large variety of uh, businesses that are focused on UK startups is, mm. is what, I, what I have to, what I have to say. And um, if for uh, UK graduates or postgraduates, uh, it's obviously very helpful to approach those institutions, speak to the chairs or teachers in the uh, entrepreneurial department or the venture capital department, if that exists, and get introductions on uh, on that space. So I'm uh, personally a graduate of uh, London Business School, and we have the E100 uh, angel network. But uh, as I said, uh, pretty much every every university and business school has such a network. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, okay, uh, so when you've got the pitch deck and you're reading it and and how many how long do you sort of spend on the pitch deck do you read it a few times before deciding on calling or do you just give it a quick glance and can decide yes or no very quickly i mean how how's your process when you've actually got that document and you're reading it that's a good question it's a it's, it's a very good question because I, I i have to admit i have to throw the dreaded answer at you it depends right and um for, first of all uh, it's, it's it's probably the the answer to your the, to the first part of your question is definitely not long. Mm. If two minutes for the uh, in, for the whole process, if, I, if I'm spending two minutes for the whole process, then that's long. So it um, depends on the way that the approach has happened. If the approach has been relevant and personable, if I like what I what I see in the let's call it the cover letter, mm-hmm. then I definitely approach it, the approach to pitch deck with a different level of interest and patience than if I just see that it could be in an interesting field, uh, uh, but the cover letter was uninspiring. So the original, uh, the, the first time that I spent on uh, the pitch deck is around a minute, mm-hmm. maybe if that. And I'm just looking for what are they really doing? Do I understand the value proposition? And is that something, is that different from what I've seen before? And um, then sometimes I approach them as an investor, sometimes as a potential mentee, uh, Mm -hmm. sorry, as a potential mentor saying, Mm -hmm. look, I've I've seen your idea. I, I like what you're trying to do. I th- if, if you're interested, I'm happy to walk you through my thoughts, but I'm brutally honest. I will not invest. I've, I've spent an hour this morning with the company saying I'm, I'm, I'm not going to invest, but I think there are two or three items that you can, can address. So what I'm, I'm, I'm looking for my, I, I call it the, the four uh, t- tick boxes, uh, the boxes that I want to tick. Yep. And that is um, that the, business that the value proposition is clear what do they do um then who the team is and with the motivations you mentioned that in the uh, in the beginning um that they can tell me what they want the money for and um then uh, last but not least that they can uh, tell me also uh, that they understand what the uh, competition and the the other threats are because the mm-hmm. last thing I want is speaking to someone who thinks that uh, the their business the, is unique in what they're doing, because they're not. And even if they are at, at one point in time, it, the barriers to entry at the moment are close to non-existent. Yeah, I mean, it can, it can be quite a negative saying you're the only one in the space. It's like, why is that? Maybe there's no demand for it, you know? Yeah. So it is, it is tricky. Um, okay, so... Yeah. Um, would you do your own research or mini due diligence before deciding to meet or arrange a Zoom meeting after reading the pitch deck? Uh, mini is, is, is I, I was wondering what is below mini. It's probably micro research yeah. that I would be doing because um, we are looking for um, the thing that doesn't exist yet. 
So where there's very little research to be done, the zero to one kind of thing, as Peter Thiel would um, phrase it. And um, so uh, on that basis, I, I, I would do a quick couple of Googles before meeting the founders. And then, but uh, after having met the founder and deciding, yes, this idea is viable, I like the people, I can talk to them, they're open to my thoughts, that's when the due diligence kicks in. Um, and that is um, the due diligence that then follows is quite significant. And that is why it's very helpful to work in a network, to, um, to share the load, to also ideally keep each other in check to avoid the usual uh, confirmation bias and, and th those those kind of items. But uh, for, for me, meeting the founder is one of the first steps of, of the of the check. So going into the meeting with the founder, just having seen, seen the deck is I, I would say, okay, where are you? How do you feel? What do you think the issues are at this point? Um, what what do you need the money for? And um, you know, uh, give me give me a sense of why you think your uh, projections are are reasonable. We all know that those projections are are ten times overdone. We we all know that. But what we're looking for is the consistency in the thinking. How did they come up with the ambition? How committed are they to this ambition or is it just something that they put on on paper and now they're hoping that someone will give the money uh, to essentially pay for their for their hobby and um, so the research before the meeting is much more thinking about the business what is it that I've seen in the past what could be the pit, pitfalls those kind of things mm. yeah and and just going on projections and things like that I mean how much are in in the pitch deck when people put they put their growth and their and their and their projections as being very high? How do you how do you approach that? Because I've heard other investors say that they sort of almost skip past some of the projections and the sort of market size and stuff like that because it's always wrong. Uh, how yeah. how do you sort of see those particular slides of the pitch deck? Do you take them with a pinch of salt, or do you look to research them, or or how do you sort of approach it? No. <laughs> A big pitch of salt. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I'm, I'm more on the side of what, what, what you were just mentioning. So, uh, ideally, the product or service doesn't exist yet. So they're addressing essentially a new market. And uh, yes, uh, if someone is addressing the uh, on uh, the cancer related market, I, I don't need to hear that there are billions of cancer diagnosis every every year mm. it shows that the um, that the founder has done some background research but uh, it's, it's it's not going to be uh, the uh, the killer argument to in, in invest in the company and it is uh, we, we all know that it's close to impossible to um, predict what will happen to the business uh long five years out three years out um sometimes even just one year out because things change so quickly and we want them to change what um i personally do want to see though is that there's consistency in this thinking that the person has gone into the model has um played with the numbers appreciate understands what has to happen so what well, question a founder could expect from me much more is like, oh, I can see that you're expecting revenues to triple between 2023 and 2024. What are the assumptions? Are you assuming that you're signing up new clients? Are you entering a new country or are you launching a new product? How much of this is the new product uh, doing? And then uh, also now it's May, 2023. And you are forecasting, I don't know, 500,000 revenue by the end of the year. How much of that have you already committed? How much is of that is already firmly recurring? And it's in the language, it's in the thinking 
um, that I'm, I'm assessing the projection. So if someone says, well, you know, the typical client is booking three times a month with me, therefore I call three times a month uh, times 20 pounds, uh, the MRR, that is not the way I look at numbers. Uh, I, I want people who are consistent and rigorous in their thinking and then uh, who are able to adjust the forecast as they as they go along. And and with those numbers, um, how much of those sort of detail, how much detail do you expect to see the numbers just in the pitch deck? Is it something that you you want to like see a top level there in the deck? Or is it something that you want to sort of you actually want that information maybe as another hyperlink so you can so you can look into it more before doing a call? I mean, what what sort of level of detail do you like to see in the in the pitch deck for the numbers? It's a very good question. It's um it's a it's a very good question. Uh, I, I think we angel investors are backing founders w- with a vision who want to yeah. build an exciting business. They're they're not backing CFOs who make who build beautiful models. So uh, in the pitch deck, especially in the initial pitch deck, I would want to see uh, a forecast uh, with, uh, uh, with the revenue line, uh, with the uh, ex- expected profits or the, the uh, break even. If, if the break even doesn't happen in the next uh, two, three years, then just, just be honest about that. Mm-hmm. It doesn't need to go into the details. It doesn't need to go into uh, exactly uh, what is driving each part of the revenue. If um, the company is expecting a new product to be launched in late 2024, that will be a game changer for the business model. Of course, that will need to be highlighted. But at this point, I don't want to see that it's 7% con- consulting fees, 25% subscription, and and so on. That is that is for afterwards. That is for when when we meet. But when when I meet the founder, I would expect relatively quickly to have access to a, a, the link of a data room. And in the data room, that is where I would want to find a, a very significant amount of information and detail. That's where I would want to see the actual the actual accounts, the forecasts. I would want to see uh, agreements. Uh, I, I I would want to find all all sorts of papers that give me the confidence that I understand the company that I'm investing in. And that is something that I can only encourage founders to start. Uh, putting together as early as possible whenever you've got a formal document make sure f- you know where you filed it and then keep it up to date mm-hmm. so you want to see quite a lot of documentation in that data room then is, is there is there a kind of like a a checklist that you can sort of r- r- rally off now for for anyone listening to the data room it's it's too extensive to uh right. to rattle off but it's on the website um proservo uh, under resources, I've got a list of um, documents that I would like to see. This this list is obviously I didn't develop this list in a dark room by myself. So this yep. comes from working with uh, with other investors, but it's definitely uh, being being able to um, document the history, the legal uh, and financial history of your of your company, the commitment of um uh, of the d- different individuals whether they are um off balance sheet liabilities please be very open about that right away because it's very unpleasant if we do all the due diligence and then we find that you've promised parts of the proceeds to someone else who's been working for free or who's been you use- letting you use the office and those kind of things but as I said, um, you find the comprehensive list uh, on on the website of uh, proserver.com. Mm. Well, that's great. Well, what I'll do is I'll put a link to that. I'll get that link off you later, and we'll we'll put that in the comments. And, and uh, Dave, and- just to um, just to add, there are also a couple of links for that um, angel investors want to use to look at uh, things that can trip up uh, founders, like the EIS uh, pre-approval, the legal questions and 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 the like it's 
it's not all my, my proprietary stuff, but it's links to people that I've worked with in the past and that I found really helpful. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, that, that's a great resource. Um, I just want to talk about, again about just in, in the pitch deck. Now, um, I, I, I know that the traction element, the what you've done bit is is very, very important. And, and I always talk to my founders about showing evidence, you know, the evidence that there's there's a desire for this and a need for it. But you touched a little bit on the the growth strategies and the projections bit. So I just want to sort of get a, a, a real grip on what is it that, that you like to read about as something like a tangible growth strategy? Is it that they've, you know, they might not have the biggest marketing budgets, but if they've done some marketing and maybe they've had some failed campaigns and some successful campaigns, is that a much better position to be in than if they hadn't done marketing or it, like you talked about other territories? I mean, is there anything in particular that sort of stands out for you that you've read in a pitch deck where it's going, that is a fantastic story for a growth strategy. I can really believe that growth, that growth strategy. Yeah, I mean, failure is never a problem. Mm. Failure and not being open to correct the course is a problem. Mm. And uh, uh, failure and not being able to vocalize why that path was chosen is a problem. But if someone has chosen a path for a good reason and it did not work out, that is that is not a problem at all. And so um, I don't think people should start off with what didn't go right. And uh, be because we, no, no one wants to, um, to, uh, to, to see a flag that things go wrong. Let's, we, we all want to dream. We all want to think that we're changing the world. So obviously in the age of um, viral marketing, a lot can be achieved, especially in the early stages with close to no cost. So um, in, in my space, in the fintech space, I tend to see it as a red flag if people have been spending too much on marketing in the very early stages, because this is this feels very much like the earlier uh, the early days of the century or um, in, the, in the last Nasdaq boom uh, when when there was just too much money going around. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we don't need to spend a lot on marketing for a variety of reasons. We've got uh, we've got artificial intelligence. We've got fantastic access of very motivated staff around the world that are happy to help us with um, with uh, with the marketing. We've got well, we can do a lot of it uh, ourselves. Um, so to to me, that is almost uh, a sign of the uh, flexible thinking of the founder, how far they've been able to stretch their pound. Uh, is it good if they? If they save on marketing spend and in return have a very subdued growth, of course not. Um, because in in my business, probably the the exit will happen when a VC comes in and and says to the angel, "Thank you very much, Alex. We take it from here." Mm -hmm. Or more often, when a strategic investor comes and says, "Look, um, we we like what we see." Um, can but we 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 want to integrate it into our existing business. So therefore, we need to have good momentum behind uh, behind the growth. But uh, as as I said, we don't need a big uh, parties in London clubs to uh, launch a new startup. We can we can uh, get very far in terms of marketing with a relatively little expense. And to me, that is also a good way of assessing how flexible the founder is and how well they understand the value of the money that I, I'm trusting in them. Yeah, it's interesting. So, um, and then going back to traction, you're saying that you, as an angel investor, you might invest in quite a few things that are kind of MVP and stuff like that. And, and, What's the best way for a, a founder to, to prove or to show you traction even kind of before they've got to the market or even before they've got to the, the, that or they're at that MVP stage and they haven't got a final product? How can what's the best? What do you look for in terms of like evidence like to say, yes, I can see this is going to work or 
you know, what you presented me makes sense in terms of I can see the traction. Yeah, I definitely would not invest uh, pre-MVP. Uh, yeah. So there are too many uh, nice ideas out there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, execution is key. And uh, uh, getting to the MVP stage is already a very powerful filter to separate the founder who's just got a good idea and who can afford to take some time off work and to someone who's really serious about it. And um, it also means that that person is now becoming clear about the value that the idea is trying to deliver. So because the MVP, by the nature of the beast, has to can only address the the one pain point um, that the whole business is, is trying to address. So mm -hmm. this is, I would definitely see, need to see an MVP, but um, mm -hmm. your question was more about the proof of concept. It's uh, they- or, or maybe proof of, proof that it's going to be, that people are going to buy it. Pe people are going to love it. You know, even before you got that finalized product, because a lot of a lot of a lot of um, people that I talk to, they go, "Well, we haven't got to market yet," and I said, "You got to, you got to come, you got to have some evidence to show an investor that this is something that people are going to love." Exactly, exactly. And um, I mean, it's ideal if you've got cu customer references, and yep. then in the small company space. Uh, we want each other to succeed if we're not competing directly. So a lot of uh, businesses uh, are very, uh, very happy to become reference customers uh, if they can use your product for free and uh, or if they've worked um, together in the past. So I would want to get a testimonial from mm -hmm. someone who's used it in the professional context who put his or her head on the line by mm. using the reporting tool in that um, uh, in that context. Or uh, another company that I'm invested in uh, called Fiscal, they're doing the financial, the, the accounting tool for SMEs. Uh, so and anyone who's been using it for their small businesses, I can also use it myself for a week right. or two. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm geeky to, to, set the, to, to that extent, but I'm dearly obviously they would already have some some marketing data. They would have, they would be able to say, "Look, we've had a campaign where we've uh, approached a, a thousand uh, individuals with the uh, title financial director in LinkedIn or whatever their tool is. Uh, we've had a, a reply rate, a response rate of ten uh, percent, and then we've converted two percent." Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, if, if, if those numbers are not ideal, uh, that already gives me the level of professional, this level of structured thinking, uh, the, the, the level of uh, professionalism that means that I can talk to them about, okay, are you happy with 2%? Is that satisfactory? Have you thought about how you can improve it? And, and then they can say, yeah, we, we would rather have 5%. And therefore, we're going to tweak the, the search words and we're talking to someone about that one. Those kind of things work really well for me. And um, is that the proof of concept? Yes and no. And that is why I like to stick to fintech in the space where I understand the pain point, where I understand where value is lost, where... Uh, senior managers are cursing under their breath when they have to spend time on paperwork and I see a company a solution that could automate that reliably so um, sometimes I need to trust my own experience and um, as I said that's why I like uh, I like the fintech space because I've seen those pain points mm -hmm. and, and is there anything that you think that you specifically look out for maybe in that particular sector of, of investments uh, of, of potential companies that other investors might not look at or ha don't look at to the same level as you, or maybe is there something that you look for that other people don't? Yeah. Um, it's, an, so it's, a, it's a very good question. I, I'm, I'm not smarter than, than the next guy. Uh, it's, I think um, what we can do as angel investors is mainly weed out the obvious red flags with our due diligence. And from then on, we've got 
one chance out of five that a startup will still be around uh, in two, three years. Uh, hopefully with our help, both financial and with our experience, with our network, we can double that, uh, the, that chance. But um, the, the risk will always be there. And um, what, where I'm, I, th I think where I've got a, an edge over other people that let's say who've got the financial resources is it is a different mindset investing as an angel in EIS, SEIS, because mm -hmm. um, very often I, I'm working together with first time angels and a, a lot of the process of the due diligence is education. So yes, a company can be worth four or five million pre-money even though it is two, three years away from break even. That is not an obvious conclusion for someone who's investing in traditional businesses. Yeah. Uh, likewise, essentially, once you've committed that money, it is gone. So it is, there is no point hoping for, uh, for financial statements at the end of the year because th th there's nothing you can act on. And um, so, what what I'm what I'm trying to say is, as an angel, the edge that an angel has, we've seen the things that can go wrong. Um, we can bring those experiences to the discussion with the founders, hopefully without making them feel defensive. We can bring the uh, mindset of having a portfolio of uh, angel investments to, to the table so that we're more comfortable with gaps, with the uh, known unknowns, but to, to a large extent also the unknown unknowns, if I can, uh, can borrow Donald Rumsfeld's term. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that one. It's not an endorsement, but it's a, I, I think it's yeah. a powerful term. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, okay, well, um, uh, just a couple of questions left, but um, this this next one might be a, a bit of a sore spot, maybe. But um, is there is there one I want you to sort of tell us if there was an occasion where there was one that got away, the one that you wish you'd invested in, and you didn't, and you saw it, you know, it take off. Was it as a as has that happened to you? Uh, yeah, but it's uh, uh, it's it's always too early days. Uh, it's uh, the life cycle of an angel investment is somewhere between five and ten years. Mm. I, I've seen I've seen some uh, investments being massively successful that I looked at and I was like, oh, yet another one of those. That's right. never going. And it turned out to be the one that flew. Yeah. But um, I've also had um, a, a pitch on my my table. I listened to. Um, the the pitch and it was just not a not a good time because I was uh, in the process of completing on on other deals and now these companies are are, are doing really well but I, I think what is important to keep in mind um, the investment is never complete until the money is in the bank yeah. and um, uh, I've, uh, last night I was just finishing my blog about uh, earnouts that very often uh, my fellow investors or uh, founders that I speak to are bragging about an exit that they have or have had. And then it turns out that a uh, large part is an earnout, and then that money never comes. So um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is uh, I have not had that obvious one where I was flipping a coin, should I invest, should I not invest? Right. And it turned to be the wrong decision. But I've been exposed to some companies in which I, for whatever reason, have not invested. And that turned out to be successful. But that's mm. the nature of the business. Mm. And have you personally seen a difference or, or have been influenced or, or have changed your attitudes recently? And I'm talking to sort of post-2023, it seems that the investor appetite has slowed down or changed a little bit. Have you seen a change? Yeah, it's... um. I, I mentioned the first-time angels that mm. education, and definitely those people are looking at the Nasdaq. They're reading headlines like Klarna. They're reading headlines like Revolut, mm. which have nothing to do with us, but with the kind of investment style that I'm, I'm involved in. 
Uh, but but they, they they get scared. They run away. They say, "Ah, oh, there's no corporate governance. The, these things uh, will never make money. Those kind of things." So they stay away. Um, well, what also has gone away are those I call them um, family offices. Those were in like the, those were inbound investors uh, uh, that were offering money to founders at outrageous valuations, very mm. attractive valuations, but clearly did not know anything about the space. And uh, it's, it's the kind of um, companies that would then say, um, uh, so when can we expect the first dividend? And we would say never. Um, and so since these are very deep pockets, they have fallen away. What in my network space has happened is that uh, we are aware we get better valuations. We expect more attractive valuations. Uh, we expect cooperative founders, um, but um, and uh, but to some extent, uh, some of us are investing a bit less because obviously our exits are delayed. So right. there's there, uh, there's less money to redeploy. Is there is it really a big problem in in our space? I, I would say we're back to 70 to 80% of what we were um, uh, just pre-crisis. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so one, one, thank you so much for doing this. And I've, I've, I've learned so much. And I'm sure all the listeners have as well. But um, if you were to give uh, uh, one piece or maybe three pieces of killer advice when you're entering a fundraise, what would they be off the top of your head? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely... Um, uh, it's, it's definitely be clear of all the data before you speak to um, to to the investors. So ideally have the, um, the the data room ready, but be clear in your head what the numbers are, um, how much your key staff works, um, how your uh, commit, uh, how the key personnel is committed, uh, what sort of options they have, but. More, more importantly, where your sales pipeline sits. So um, try not to be too fluffy with the um, with the sales process. Uh, if if you've only spoken to a, a blue chip client, that is that doesn't mean you've signed them signed them up. So those things be very clear in your head about the message that you're selling. But the second point is, um, I would argue, don't bother fundraising unless you have an MVP, and from an investor's uh, perspective, unless they, they can actively help you build that MVP, uh, it is far too risky and you can barely reflect that in, in a valuation uh, discount. And uh, from your perspective, you have to bring down the valuation so much that yeah. uh, you lose a very, very large uh, chunk of your company uh, to, to make you wonder whether this is still worthwhile. And then then uh, obviously make make sure you understand wh what you want the investor for. And uh, talking to, uh, let's say, a general group, that's, that's fair enough. But if you're speaking to a network, know who you're talking to, what sort of um, investment style they're, they're, they're looking for and what you, what you can get from them. Because angels, um, we're... We're doing it uh, for the financial return, of course, but we also do it because we, we've come to a point where we want to pass on the experience. We want to we want to help the next generation, and we obviously want to make sure that innovation stays alive. And mm. So make sure you are where you are talking, who you are talking to, and that you um, give us the best opportunity uh, to help you. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for talking. It's been really, really interesting. And um, yeah, just thank you for coming on board. Thank you, Dave.